Thanks so much, Miriam. I'm excited to talk with Jess Joss today and find out what it's like to be an angel investor. Jess, there might be some people who don't quite understand what an angel is and, and what they do. So my understanding is that an angel investor is at sort of the very early stages of venture capital mm -hmm. and they invest primarily for themselves and in stuff they like. Quite but that they're still pretty the demanding in terms of what kind of returns they're looking for. How do you describe angel investing? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here and thank you, Rick, for helping uh, conduct this conversation. Um, from an angel investing perspective, uh, I guess the first point of clarification is angel investors are not philanthropists. They are not doing charity. So you're absolutely right that there is an expectation of a return. Um, angel investors tend to invest their own money, so they use their own criteria. Um, you know, in Venture capital, you may use the thesis of the fund that you're working with, but in angel investing, it's what you're interested in investing in. Uh, a good policy is to invest either in an area that you're very strong in, so you're a subject matter expert, and go deep in that area, or create a portfolio where you have ones from across different industries so that you can sort of mitigate risks. But angel investors tend to be early stage investors. Um, some people go in very early stage where it's in the ideation stage and it's like here's my napkin and it's beautiful. Um, by and large, I would say in our ecosystem in Ontario, the majority of angel investors, the ones that would call themselves uh, professional angels, tend to go in post-concept, post-revenue or just on the cusp of revenue and they're looking to take an equity stake in the, in the company or they're looking to invest and invest for the long term. Um, and as angels, we like to say we're smart money because we're not just the money. There's cheaper places to get money for your business, but it's bringing the networks, the experience. Many angels are exited entrepreneurs themselves, so they've been through the trenches. They understand you know, the challenges and uh, can share some of their, their stories or you know, perhaps you say, oh, this is what I did in that situation and I really wouldn't recommend doing it that way, so maybe try a different route and so on. Um, but angels generally like to, there's you know, different types of angels, some like to be very hands-on and work with the entrepreneurs, others are a little bit more come to me when you need help, but by and large it is you know, an individual who's been an entrepreneur or has an interest in business investing their own dollars into a company to help that company grow and scale. So let's say I have an idea and, yeah. and, and it, frankly it can't miss. What kind of money could I expect yeah. from a sort of a typical angel investor mm -hmm. and what do they want from me in return in terms of equity, expected mm -hmm. return, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I would say um, every angel has you know, what their own parameters are, but by and large if you look in the Ontario ecosystem there's a lot of angel groups where angels come together and within those groups they are looking at making often somewhere between 250 to just over a million dollars worth of investment, um, sometimes in tranches or sometimes in one investment. So how much each individual angel puts in varies depending on uh, the deal, the organizations and the rules. Some organizations like to have a minimum of 25K, other organizations are a little bit uh, more flexible in how they do it and the angels can come in at a lower, a lower price point. What an angel is looking for is um, they're looking to, I mean, they're looking for an ownership stake, but one of the things I always like to tell entrepreneurs is angels aren't looking to be uh, operators. You know, most of them have had the opportunity to exit business and they want flexibility in their lifestyle. Uh, we used to do things like travel and stuff like that. You know, that, that may be passe, but they, they want to have flexibility within their life. They don't want to be, you know, 20 hours a day in the business and so on. So that's not what they're looking for. They're looking to share some of their expertise to help to grow, to build, um, taking an equity stake and then general term sheets generally have a board member so if you're uh, if you have a group of angels coming in one would be selected to represent the angels once they're on the board the fiduciary responsibilities to the business not to the angels which is an interesting uh, demarcation um, but there generally there is some sort of board related role for the angel investors as a whole right and how long are they likely to stick oh. with before they want to get out other things. So when I started investing about 11 years ago, all the data we had was from Silicon Valley. So we're like, oh, we're getting out, you know, three to five years, we're out and it's going to be big. And, um, and that was really exciting information, but not necessarily the reality. Um, so I would say by and large, when I, uh, when I was bringing angels into a group, I would say, you know, look at probably like a 
seven to ten year timeline. We hope for it to be less, but you know you want to make sure that the company has enough you know opportunity to grow and to excel. Um, that having been said, most of my exits have been in less than that time period. And in terms of the returns, uh, the earlier you invest, the riskier it is, but it's cheaper. So you like to see you know you like to see good solid higher returns. Um, but it's again, it's so industry dependent, and there's so many verticals that you can invest in that there's not, you know, sort of a carte blanche off the top that we always get X. You know, everyone's individual portfolio has a different return. Right. So I hear you want like ten times your money back. Ten times is lovely. Uh, I've had less and been very delighted because if you look at it, so. There's a portfolio strategy for angels. So they say over the lifetime, you know, it's great to invest in 10 to 30 um, companies. And the reason you do that is because some are going to... They're not all sure things. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, like, some are going to hit it out of the park, and that's fantastic. And then some are going to die quickly. And that's also kind of fantastic, because at least you know where you stand and you're not sinking more money in. Um, and then there's the in-between ones that some limp a little long, and then they sort of grow. Some have, like, steady growth. Some never really go anywhere. Um, so you need to have a portfolio in order to be able to cross industries, but also cross stages of the business. Some are a little bit earlier, some are a little bit later on. And then you sort of created hedging a bet, hedging your bets in terms of where you're going. So 10x, absolutely lovely. Um, on the other hand, you know, 3x and you haven't lost your money in the angel world can also be, I mean, it's not necessarily the goal, but it's still better than, you know, losing your money for a company that goes south. So, you know, you have to look at it along the way, because you're right, they're not sure bets. And, you know, we're, I think when you invest as an angel, you're looking at the company, but you're also looking at the entrepreneur. And in the back of your mind, you're like, well, we hope this company does well. But if I'm, you know, for example, very confident with the entrepreneur, then maybe, you know, even if this one doesn't work out, maybe the second startup is going to work out. So you're also sort of looking at that long-term relationship. But portfolio is really important to mitigate risk. and. You know, so I'm in 52 companies, and in terms of, you know, I've had exits and Currently in 52 companies. F uh, done 52 company done. investments okay. overall. I've exited uh, some of them. I have two partners, and we've, um, we've done it together. So, you know, we've had ones that have, we've written off. We've had ones that have exited. We have ones that assure us that things are going well, and some that actually are really doing well. <laughs> and so, you know, it's sort of, it's a whole range, and you have them at different stages, and then you balance it out. I really want to get uh, into some of those companies, some of the experiences mm -hmm. you've had a, as an angel. But first, let's go back a little bit. Before you were an angel, you were an entrepreneur. And I understand you go back a long way <laughs> yeah. as an entrepreneur. So tell me a little bit about your journey as a business person, as an entrepreneur, as a risk taker before you became an angel. Absolutely, yeah. So I always joke that my first business was in grade four, reselling candy, uh, buying it wholesale, packaging it, and then providing it on the school premises where there was no access to candy. And that was my early stage venture. But I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. Um, my father had a wonderful career at IBM and left and started a business. And so I, uh, I grew up in the trenches of planting the flowers out front on Saturdays and being at, you know, uh, being at a lot of the company events and so on and sort of grew up through that business. Um, so I had a very good sense of what it took to be a successful entrepreneur. When I graduated from university, I, um, I tried to figure out what to do with my life. And I Were wanted history to... history major? Very good. History, politics. Yeah, I spent most of my time doing student government, um, so, which is, was my love, but not necessarily providing you know, a direct career path. So I actually started a company right out of university, and I started it in uh, online marketing and web design. And it was one area back, I'm dating myself, but back in the area where it was very new and a lot of companies didn't have websites. And they're like, oh, you're young. You can do this for me and fix it and make it happen. So being uh, young had credibility at that point in time. And so I still have that business today. It's continued to evolve. So I started it in 97. It started as a web design firm, grew. I brought people in house. Uh, 2002, I brought on a partner, changed the name to Insightful Solutions. And it. Uh, over the years, we've consolidated, brought in some other companies and basically an, a digital agency at this point. So off off-site marketing for a wide variety of customers. Some of my customers I've had now for 18, 20 years. I'm no longer operational in the business, um, but yeah, so main focus is uh, social and search. And how do you start to make that transition from entrepreneur to angel? Do opportunities just sort of seem to come to you or do you start seeking them out? Well, I think, you know, 
some people are very intentional, but I also think when I started um, 10, 11 years ago, there wasn't as much information about angels. So um, I grew up, as I said, in an entrepreneurial household, and my father had investments, but we would never have thought of them as angel investments because that moniker just wasn't com commonly held. Um, but as I grew my business, some opportunities came my direction, and then um, an organization called York Angels was looking for some space to hold meetings. I had extra boardroom capacity, so they ho started holding meetings in my, uh, in my space, and then slowly I got involved that way. So I started as a member there, um, ooh, I think it was probably maybe 2010, 2009. Um, and again, that was in the more earlier stages of angel investing. Not that angel investing hadn't been happening, but there wasn't a lot of groups and there wasn't a lot of maybe sort of publicity with regards to it. It was more of an individ individ individualistic <laughs> <laughs> um, activity. But yeah, so, I, so then I started seeing my deal flow through a group, um, curated deal flow through, a, through an organization. So that's you know, when I maybe stepped up my game a little bit more and started investing more. So have, do you always invest as part of a group then, rather yeah. than as a Yeah, yourself? so um, I have two partners and we have invested outside of groups before, but all of our more successful deals have come through a group. And once we were uh, solidly aligned with an angel group, we put, even if we were bringing deals to table, we'd put it through and bring other angels in on it. And one of the things we found, the, there's a real value in the collective wisdom. Angels are, they're eclectic. They come from very different backgrounds. By and large, they're lifelong learners, uh, sometimes strong personalities, but they have, uh, they bring a lot of wisdom to the table. So when you can have that collective wisdom, looking at a deal from different sides when you're doing due diligence, is something that really um, adds a lot of value. You know, I come from a marketing side. I, I get excited about things like that. There's never been a financial spreadsheet that has like excited me. <laughs> you know, it's like so. You know, you need people with different skill sets around the table. My partners bring that, but also other angels. And then you, I find we get much better deals. And also, you can negotiate better deals because your collective capital coming in. Right. Yeah. Right. I was the editor of Profit Magazine yeah. for many years, and because you started at twelve. Because <clears throat> I started at twelve. So back in the early 1990s, Profit Magazine did something no magazine has ever done. We invested $1,000 into the first survey ever of Canadian angel entrepreneurs. Amazing. Uh, yeah. By Alan Riding okay. uh, out yeah. of Ottawa. They came and pitched to us. We said, we're a magazine. We don't invest yeah. in this stuff. And they said, well, someone's got to get this started. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we said, OK. And so we, were, we, we, we negotiated tough like an angel investor. We said, we get full first rights. Yeah to the study, and it was a, a groundbreaking study. For sure. At the time, we're talking nearly 30 years ago now, angels were former, former entrepreneurs, or sometimes, yep. you know, sort of entrepreneurs who have been successful and want that thrill again. Yeah. But also doctors and dentists, mm -hmm. because they were the sort of people, and to some extent lawyers, although they were risk averse. Yeah, fair. Um, um, but they wanted a little bit of thrill with some of their money. They already had all the GICs mm -hmm. and, and mutual funds they needed, but they wanted some mad money to play with. Breaking yeah. rights on the golf course of the cool thing that they'd done, right? <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. For sure. I've inv invested in MS-DOS. Yes, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, it was a long time ago. What's, ex what's excited me is, is exactly this evolution that mm -hmm. you described, which is going from individuals who had no idea what they were doing yeah to groups that do have expertise, mm -hmm. they now have experience, they've yep. got a track record, and they have, uh, you know, bringing diverse groups of talent so that they can actually help yeah. the organizations under, you know, best possible yep. circumstances. For sure. And, uh, and, and, and so, so the, the area's really changed. And you've had a, a, a part of that because you've been a builder in this I love ecosystem. the ecosystem, yeah. So, yeah, so, so, so tell me a little bit about uh, what it was like to build this ecosystem mm -hmm. and why the situation we have now is better than it, it used to yeah, be. Absolutely. So I think one of the things, um, so in, in my personal journey, I became an angel investor and then a few years later I became executive director of this teeny group of like 32 people uh, and that was sort of my foyer into the being on the organizational side. Um, and that was at a time where the ecosystem was starting to grow. We had received both provincial and federal uh, funding, which standing on a soapbox, I think is fundamentally important. Because if you can have organizations that help angels come together, 
find curated deal flow and help them invest. Not that we're doing the, like not that the organizations do the investment, but they help make the, the dating service possible. You know, great angels and great deals, they come together and magic happens in the room. I think that that's something that really helps the economy. Because sometimes as lone angels, you don't necessarily, some angels get lots of deal flow. Um, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, I say I'm an angel and I get a lot of requests. But a lot of them aren't curated, a lot of them aren't ready, a lot of them, you know. So coming together when you have curated deal flow coming to a group I think is really important for the groups. Um, so I was executive director of York Angels from 2014 to 2019 and during that time um, the organization, it really grew. We had an amazing team, we had an amazing team of angels. So we got up to be 145 angels working collectively um, and that's a lot of synergy because there's lots of deals coming in, lots of people have contacts, you bring a lot of value to the companies and so on. Uh, so that was a really amazing opportunity and when I look at the ecosystem during that time we got up to about 13 different groups within Ontario and when I say groups I'm talking about not-for-profit ones that are, um, they are just the the dating agency, so to speak. They're not doing, they're not funds doing their investments. Some of them have adjunct funds, but they themselves are sort of administrating the deals and help curating it. Um, and I think that was a big change within the ecosystem because there were a lot of people out there that didn't necessarily know they were angels or a lot of people that wanted to get into angel investing. They had the resources, but maybe didn't know how you'd go about what are the best practices? How do you go about effective due diligence? How do you negotiate a term sheet? All those things. So as the groups got more formalized and angel investing became more professional, there were a lot of educational opportunities. So I've been on the board now for NACO for a couple of years. Uh, NACO, NACO is a National Angel Capital Organization that actually represents angels, accelerators, incubators. And one of the things they had as, was a very big focus on education. So education for the angels, opportunities for the entrepreneurs and the angels to interact. And what, that, uh, what I saw over the years was that angel investing became a word that people knew, that it was a bit more respected, and that it had some sort of parameters or guidelines with it. Um, and I think that's been very healthy for the ecosystem. Um, and I, it's interesting because it's still a tight ecosystem. I'll have somebody at an accelerator call and say, I had this individual angel approach me who's not part of a group or says they're part of a group. Can you sort of vouch for them? So there's a lot of um, sort of ties going back and forth because the accelerator wants to make sure that only good people are you know, accessing their companies and so on. So there's a, a lot of collaboration within the ecosystem. Um, and then in 2019, I left um, York Angels. Sadly, I did love them, but it was time to try a new opportunity. And um, a new player came into the ecosystem, which was Equation, which was bringing together three angel groups, uh, and now four, um, in the Ontario Inc. Um, ecosystem and that was uh, the theory was sort of consolidation and we could bring better value to the entrepreneurs if um, if you had 200 angels that you had access to in one fell swoop and so on so that uh, was sort of the 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 thought process behind that and uh, but the ecosystem itself it's been very interesting to see because angels have moved upstream ten years ago they were you know a little earlier stage in terms of where they invested. Now, as you professionalize, you've moved a little bit further on. You want to be, you know, post-concept and likely post-revenue. Um, but the other thing that's happened in that time frame is that a lot of VCs and a lot of funds have come downstream a little bit. So they're looking at earlier and earlier stage. So there's a lot of angel funds and a lot of um, sort of startup slash, you know, early stage scale-up funds. And that's different ways for people to access and, be, and get into the um, into the game, so to speak. Right, right. So, so can you help us understand what's the difference between venture capital mm -hmm. and angels? Is angel investing venture capital, first of all, in and of itself? So the way and where do the professionals come in? So venture, I mean, the way I define it, and I think that's one of the things that you'll find in this industry is everyone has sort of their own definitions. But for me, venture capital means that you're by and large investing other people's money that you're a fund, that you're investing often larger amounts, but not always, um, but that you're investing other people's money, which means you have a fiduciary responsibility to stick to the thesis that you presented on. Because if you're creating a fund, you have a thesis, people buy into that thesis, and then you go out and find the companies that fill it. So you have to stick to the thesis that you presented to. Um, you have to report regularly to your, uh, your partners, your LPs, your shareholders in essence, um, and also, in some funds, you're not, you're, you have a, n a nominal amount of your own money in there, so you really are investing other people's money. And also there's a whole life cycle within funds um, or uh, you know, within that side. So it's a bit more prescriptive in how you go about the investing in terms of like you have certain timelines that you have to fit, you have to build out a portfolio to have the certain um, different aspects so that 
you're going to get the returns that you need to show your LPs and so on. Whereas angels can invest individually. They're investing their own money. And so an angel can watch all the pitches and can sit there and say, I like this one. You know, like they don't have to justify, it doesn't have to hit a thesis. It's their internal gut. And you see that sometimes. Like there are ones where people, they're just like, I like the entrepreneur, I like the idea. Maybe the metrics don't look great now, but I believe. And so there's an element of belief, and you can do that because it's your own money. Um, when you're, you know, a professional organization with returns and partners and stuff like that, you, you don't gamble quite the same way. On the other hand, they also have to have, uh, they're doing it full time, and they have expertise, and they bring value to. So, you know, there's pros and cons to both sides, but I see it as a continuum. You sort of start, you know. Right, it's not either or. No, it's absolutely. And sometimes it's co-investing together, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's a real continuum now. I think that, you know, you look at sort of, incubators and accelerators and some government bootstrapping incubators accelerators some government funding angels get involved they bring money but they also bring some expertise there's some government funding that then gets unlocked because you have angel investing where you might get some or in good times you get some matching money and so on and then you know as that company grows angels may do another round an institutional investor may come in alongside an institutional investor may want to pull out the angels they don't want little people in anymore from an angel perspective, I'm still exiting, so you know, it doesn't matter to me exactly how it happens. Uh, and then you continue to move up into you know, your bigger rounds, your A's, your B's, and so on, your Series A. Do the angels usually get out by that time? In the, in, in it depends, yeah. Lines? So quite often, I mean, one of your biggest challenges as an angel is there aren't liquidity events, um, meaning that your money is locked in, and a liquidity event could be that another company comes along and buys the company and you get your money out, or a bigger investor comes along and wants the little people out and you have your secondary. So I ha I've had a couple of those where, you know, sort of round three and I had to decide, do I want to, you know, have a very small piece of a bigger thing or do I actually want to have access to capital that might be locked in for another five years if I don't? Um, or a company goes public. Like there's different types of liquidity events that might get triggered. Angels, um, average individual angels, not super angels, are often out by the time you're getting up towards your series A and so on. Um, so they could exit through a secondary, which is, um, you know, if somebody, uh, a bigger institution comes in to invest, uh, it may be that the company that you're in gets acquired by another one. That's been some of my exits. Or the company could go public. So there's different ways that you can get your money out, uh, and sometimes you don't. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the companies you've invested in, and mm -hmm. you can choose whether or not to name them. Yep. We might be interested in hearing their names. For sure. Um, you know, th what are some have been, that have been memorable in terms of either giving you a really good return mm -hmm. or an exciting ride? Um, you know, there's, first of all, I think that, I should say, like, given the breadth of companies that I'm in, I think that there's something to be said for the hard work and the tenacity that the entrepreneurs put in, because it is a hard ride and it's a lot of ups and downs. So when I name somebody here, and I'm celebrating the success, you know, that doesn't mean that the other ones aren't successful and they've, they've grown different ways and stuff. So, you know, because I, I think there's, there should be recognition for how hard it is to create a startup that grows. Um, you know, companies that have been really positive, HT Base was a great company. It was hardware based, it was bought um, by a California company, so, amazing entrepreneur, incredibly tenacious. Um, lovely returns that was a couple of years ago um and Sorry, what did they do they were hard uh, specifically hardware and um, uh, fans and chips within boards but a special technology uh, and what attracted you to them initially it was so here's angel investing do i know anything about hardware no -uh. but did i have an angel colleague who was an expert in this field totally believed in the entrepreneur loved the technology and was able to water it down enough for me to say, oh, I can see why that would be good. I can't tell you the pros and cons of this industry, but I can see why that would be good. And that person went on the board and that person was incredibly helpful to them. I was like, I rode coattails. It was fantastic. I'm happy to ride those coattails because you have to know what your expertise is, right? I'm, I'm in a cybersecurity deal now. I, I love the entrepreneur. I think the company's great. But again, I am not a cybersecurity expert. But when number three in North America in cybersecurity says, I love this company, I'm going in and I'm going in, like I'm doubling down, I'm like, hmm, pick me, I'm gonna follow that, right? You know, you, so you know, you have to, sometimes you bring your own stuff to the table, sometimes you look at, but I want a diverse portfolio, so I look into different industries and I'm like, well, you're a subject matter expert and that, I think your opinion is of more value on this particular subject, so therefore I'm gonna rate my comfort that way. Um, so HD Base was an excellent exit. Uh, Top Hat Monocle, you know, Top Hat's around going gangbusters. 
I got out on a secondary many years ago um, because they were looking to take out some of the smaller investors. It was my first exit. It was in nine months. It was over three times. I was like, I'm a rock star. <laughs> that doesn't happen on a regular basis. But you know, it gave you like some false sense of security and stuff like that early on. So that was bias. <laughs> exactly. I was like, look, I know what I'm doing. Um, Enthusiast Gaming was an interesting one. That was a really interesting one for me. They are in uh, the gaming space, which first of all, I'm not. I was fascinating. So I was at York Angels at the time, and the number of people I had a personally, I had a vision of what gamers were, and they had a lot to do with like 15 year olds in the basement wearing black. And then you find like 45 angels who all adore gaming and, uh, and are hardcore gamers as well in their spare time. I'm like, good to know. Okay, learning, understanding there. And so that one was fascinating one because they had a. Uh, what did they do? So um, bringing together sites and advertising within the gaming world so that they are basically the, the one stop um, and then they have branched out they do events now they do a ton of things an incredibly committed entrepreneur an amazing team incredibly diligent and then they did a reverse IPO so as an angel it was a really exciting experience to see them grow from you know sort of two years along and all of a sudden add all these other sites add all these other audiences then start doing in person and then a reverse IPO is where you basically buy a shell that's already publicly traded, pump your comp my non-technical term, pump your company into it, go <laughs> and have your IPO and so on. And they've done some really interesting things, but that was also a great learning experience because I hadn't done an IPO before. Um, and in terms of the quality of the team and the entrepreneurs and the dedication, and you can see, um, one of the things I would say to the entrepreneurs is, you know, you can see the people that are very good at communicating with your angels because calling me, you know, eight days before you've run out of money it doesn't allow us to do anything effectively. Um, but you know, angel, people that keep in touch with their angel investors on a regular basis, people that, um, you know, it can be a quarterly email, the good, the bad, the ugly, and where I need help. It doesn't have to, like, you don't need to give me a 10 page PDF. Chances are I'm not gonna read all of that. But highlights are really good, and then I can delve into what I, you know, I can see. But sometimes I can bring value, or I can introduce you to someone. And you know, lead time, you know, angels want your company to succeed because one, they want it to, they believe in it, but two, also their money's in there, so if you fail, we lose our money. So there's um, incentive to try and help, and if you give people lead time, they may have a suggestion that when you're in the trenches, you can't see, or they may have a connection, or they may have a little bridge loan, you know, those different things. So I think the communication, open and honest on the regular basis, is really important. Right. Um, what do you see? Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you've been inside so many companies mm -hmm. with, 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 with your partners. Um, you've had a real opportunity to see what makes a business work and what makes an entrepreneur successful. So let's look at both of those things. What do you think characterizes a successful entrepreneur? Yeah, so I'd start with entrepreneur before business and the reason I say that is because entrepreneur, what makes a really solid entrepreneur doesn't always make a solid business. Um, so entrepreneurs, okay. I think, it, well, no, it's because um, there's a continuum of what I see. Because you have, uh, so entrepreneurs, I think, you know, subject matter expertise, um, dogged determination, but an ability to hear other ideas and accept or debate and justify. You know, you want someone who understands what they're doing enough that they're solid on it, but isn't, you know, a closed door of like open to, not open to any other ideas and so on. Um, hard work ethic, and that's, you know, it's lonely nights, right? And especially now, I mean, everything's so virtual and stuff like that. There's a lot of, you know, your virtual team and on your own and long hours and stuff like that. So there's um, a resilience that's required. Um, but there's also a little bit of blind optimism. Because you think about it, it's like, hey, I'm gonna start something out of nothing because I truly believe in it. And a lot of people are gonna tell me it's not going to work, but I'm still gonna do it. And I'm gonna do it all the time for a couple of years to prove people wrong. But there's that little bit of like, offside optimism there that you need to get you over that hurdle because there's nothing guaranteed, right? Um, so I think, you know, those are some of the characteristics that are really important in an entrepreneur. But in a business, and, and the reason why I differentiate it is because I think some people are great founders and they're really good with startups and they love the thrill, the chase, and the pursuing the idea and the early stage building. And then the company all of a sudden kind of gets successful and solid and they're like, Ugh. It's like, what do I do with this? This is boring. Like, they just don't know how to fill. The, the passion goes away for them. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's not a great business, but it's just, it just doesn't click for them anymore. Um, so, you know, and there's different stages, you know, and that's maybe when you need a different type of management skill set. And, you know, entrepreneurs 
and you build a team and you're in the trenches together and you're doing it and then all of a sudden you get an organization that has more employees and you have to do these things like HR and it can't all just be you know a conversation around the water cooler or whatever and stuff like that and that that isn't some people's joy processes. oh my gosh and systems and documentation oh, horrible things right so you know as the you know, and that's just not some people's jam and that's fair enough um, in terms of a successful business I think you know you're filling a market niche you're doing it better than anybody else in that industry you ideally you're sort of you will always have some types of competition but your clear value is so far above that gives you a real um, a real hurdle ideally you're in a space where you don't have to educate your consumer on what you're doing because you can have amazing bleeding edge technology are a really, really cool idea, but if you have to spend all your time explaining to the industry how you're going to help them, your sales cycle is going to be ginormously long, and that, uh, that's hard. Um, I like lean. I'm really big on lean, lots of iteration, um, continue to grow and develop. Like if your first um, product out the door isn't slightly embarrassing, then you waited too long. Like, and, and you can have that sort of analysis paralysis of what version should I do, but sometimes you have to get it out there, test, get a lot of feedback from your customers, grow, evolve, and iterate. So, so, so it, it's interesting to hear you say that because that's one of the axioms you hear a lot, you know, get that minimum viable product out. Mm -hmm. and then there's other people who say, why would you release a minimum viable product? And so there's a theoretical argument going yeah. on, but you've been there, you've seen it happen, you've seen I think there's a happy medium. A yeah. stage there. So I think there's a happy medium, um, and what I mean by that is it has to be functional enough to actually engage some interest. Uh, it has to do enough, but if you think, speaking in terms of technology, if you put developers in a room, they will have these amazing plans of how they're going to continue, going to continue, going to continue to develop, but that actually doesn't bring money in. So at some point you have to say, we're going out with these five features, and then every six months we're going to release four more and continue to, because you have to have something out in the market to get the feedback, to continue to evolve. And one of the things is you can be internally facing, thinking about what you're doing and what the industry needs, and then it hits your customer, and the customer's like, this is great, but if you add this, whew, you've just changed my world, and it's amazing. And you need that feedback, and you need that interaction. So I agree. You don't, it can't be too early that it has no functionality, that it does nothing. But on the other hand, if you wait until it's perfect, well, your chance within, somebody else has already gotten into the industry and figured out a different way of doing it, and you will, they've already created the, the market base, and people won't want to necessarily switch and so on. So there's a fine line, but you have to sort of, at some point, launch something, to, if nothing else, to get feedback, right? Right, feedback. I think it probably as a writer, you probably see this, right? Like, sooner or later, you have to have one version done, even if you don't love the version. That's right. That's or maybe not. <laughs> I want you to think back to a pitch that you heard where you eventually, deci eventually decided, no, I don't want to be part of this. But what was it? But, but, you, but you were like wanting to be, right? So you were torn. What is oh, okay. it that would make you decide in the end, no, I'm not going to go ahead and invest in this company? Well, I mean, there was one that I remember that was back at the screening stage. So um, in groups, there's often an application, and then you screen before a small group before you went into a large one. And there was one that got into a heated argument with one of the screening people, walked out of the room and slammed the door. And I thought, and that was after five minutes. So I was like, hmm, resilience, ability to take uh, conversations, look at both sides. I'm like, oh, that one passed. Um, so that, you know, you know having, um, that was not necessarily one. There, so... What I will say to entrepreneurs, and this is sort of a backwards way of answering your question, is I've seen great companies and I've seen great pitches, but I'm also cognizant that I have to put together my own portfolio. And so what I mean by that is I have to have a variety of stages, like you know, really just hitting revenue to much more successful, early, early, later, different industries um, and different sort of growth trajectories where I'm getting, and also where I'm getting in, you know, like very early and a little bit later. So I can see a great pitch and I can see something, but if I have two or three in that vertical already, I may not allocate my money that way because that bucket's full for me personally as an angel. Doesn't mean it's not a great company. It's the timing thing, for example. Or there, I've seen other great companies where you're like, yeah, but I, you know, I know this fall I have, I'm having an exit. Money will be repatriated. That's an opportunity to reinvest. But most angels have a, you know, a percentage or a formula of you're holding some dry powder to help your, your, your current investments. And especially we've seen this during COVID, a lot of angels have 
been investing into their existing portfolio companies because if you want to get them over the hurdles, you want them to survive and grow. Um, so that sort of like m pool that you had went into pre-relationships as opposed to completely brand new. So for entrepreneurs, somebody may not invest in you, but that's not that you're not a good company and a good entrepreneur. It could be where their own personal portfolio development is. And I think that's something important to remember. Why have I chosen not to invest in some companies? Um, sometimes it's the team. You know, you like the idea, but you're just not sure that the team can really take it to fruition, depending on how far it is. Um, sometimes it's that something's really interesting, but you can also see how if you're a, hypothetically, a Google or a Facebook with the vast number of people that they have employed, how they could replicate it fairly quickly. Um, sometimes there's been, um, personally, I don't do a lot in the, I'm in one, I don't do a lot in the pharma side, uh, medtech's a little bit different, but pharma where there's many years of regulation and so on, because that takes a really deep pocket. And so there are life transforming drugs and procedures and so on, but they have to go through multiple levels of um, certification and it takes a lot of money and it's deeper than my pockets you know so it's like so it just depends like it and but some people love that so there's um, it's a very personal thing why you decide and sometimes gut and that is you know that is certainly not a, a scientific thing but sometimes you're just like I'm not sure about the team or I'm not sure sometimes it's I'm not sure about the dynamics of the team and I think in 18 months we're gonna have a solopreneur trying to hire because you know you know people have left and so on so because it's harder it's like a marriage where you don't love the person but you're spending more time with them and your you know your financial stability depends on that other partner so it's a challenging relationship love can grow <laughs> love can also wither when you're really really tired <laughs> so I think we're almost out of time let okay. me ask you sure. three quick questions so lightning round oh like I answers. could do a quick answer <laughs> <laughs> So how has angel investing been affected by the whole COVID thing that we're in now? So I think the couple of points. One, a lot of angels are reinvesting in existing portfolio companies to help them over the hump. Two, the area of interest for angels is a lot of companies that are responding to what needs to happen with COVID. So whether that is med tech or health tech or whether it is something that is helping a bricks and mortar company evolve into a way to handle the pandemic. Those have been sort of the first sort of precedents of where COVID's been happening. But it also affects valuations, right? You know, things are maybe right sizing, just like a real estate market might right size some of the valuations of startups are right, right size. And so in chaos becomes lots of opportunities. So there are angels out there that are like, hmm, this is a time to get in at a more normalized valuation or you know, maybe there's a closer agreement. Right. What advice would you give to an entrepreneur who wants to attract an angel investor or an angel investor mm -hmm. group? What, what, what can they do to make themselves uh, a, a preferred invest investment? Number one tip, do not write someone on LinkedIn that you've never met before, dump out your entire deck and then demandingly follow up every couple of days that they are gonna miss out on this amazing opportunity when you've never met them before. Um, there's a it, sort of good etiquette in life also applies to pitching. I'm a big fan of people starting relationships early. One company that I'm in, and it was a small investment, but I met him as a student volunteering at an angel conference, talking over a cheese board about his idea and what he was going to do. And every three months he kept in touch with me for probably three to four years really? before he was investable. But I was like, but every time he said, I'm going to do this by next time I write you, he had done it. Boom, 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 boom. Um, so I think, you know, certainly building relationships early on is helpful. There's lots of different organizations where you have a chance to interact with angels in a non-demanding sense. And what I mean by that is not that you're asking them to look at your company, but just get to know them. Come out, see, what, you know, this type of organization like LADAMP, seeing what angels are looking for. So you start educating yourself about when to approach or, you know, um, what might be the best way in. I think the other thing is being cognizant that some angel groups or some angels have sp specific focus. So, you know, there's a new one that's all doctors. And so they're very much more sort of med tech and so on. So know your audience audience and you know find the right place for you everyone some like earlier stage some are very good at AI you know so there are specialties within the angel world do a bit of research so that you're not blanketing you know again don't throw your pitch out to every single person and hope that it sticks like spaghetti target a little bit 
Where could someone go to get more information about Equation and how it works? Sure, absolutely. So there is the Equation Angels website. Um, and then within the Ontario ecosystem, there are you know 12 to 13 groups. You can take a look through Angel Investors Ontario. Another great resource I would really recommend that isn't maybe intuitive for entrepreneurs is the National Angel Capital Organization, NACO. They do annual studies on where angel investing happens, what type of term sheets it is, where, what the dollar values are, um, different groups and what the volume that they do. So it gives you a lot of context within the industry so you can help target. Um, and they have lots of educational information and draft term sheets. So I think those are some things that entrepreneurs can do to sort of branch themselves out within the ecosystem. Final question, what if someone wanted to get in touch with you? Are you open to that? How would they get in touch with you? And how could they impress you without trying? Um, impress me without trying. Don't puke out your deck. Um, so I, I'm available on LinkedIn. Uh, that having been said, I do my investing through a group. So if you are, I invest post-concept, post-revenue um, across a breadth of industries but um, not so much in the pharma side because my pockets aren't quite deep enough to do 17 rounds. Um, and um, what would impress me? Um, building a relationship, asking, and you know, I cannot, I don't always have the capacity to respond to everything, but start by building a relationship as opposed to slamming out why I'm the best in the first sentence. Maybe even, hi, how are you? That's a crazy thing to start an email that way before you start talking about why you're the best things in sliced bread. Common courtesy, build a relationship, and then prove yourself. Fantastic. Jess, Josh, thank you so much. This Rick, thank you so much for today. It's so much terrific. fun. Yeah, I think we learned a lot about what, what angels are and how entrepreneurs can develop relationships with them. And it's so good to hear that, you know, colorful, caring, passionate people like you are involved in this because uh, financing for small business for entrepreneurs sometimes seems so difficult, but it's a reminder that there's real people here and real people who care and want to, want, want, want to make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much today.